The following sermon is presented by Southside Bible Church in Centennial, Colorado. We hope you'll be strengthened and encouraged by God's Word today as you listen. So let's go to the throne of grace and ask God to let grace and peace be multiplied to us this morning as we remember. Let's pray. Father, we come before you and I thank you for that hymn that Wesley penned. Oh God, I thank you that uh, we sat in nature's night, Lord, in our I diffused a quickening ray. Thank you, Lord, that our, our dungeon flamed with light and our chains fell off, and now we rise and go forth and follow Thee. God, it is by grace that we have been saved, and we thank You that we have been saved by Your grace. We thank You for the privilege to gather together now and to sit shoulder to shoulder and remember our blessed hope, to remember the greatest sacrifice that has ever been given, God Himself, shedding his blood in our place to redeem a people for himself. God, thank you for this glorious truth and reality. I pray now that your spirit would illuminate these words. As we open up the word that you have given to us, I pray now, God, let them get into every one of our minds. Let us understand them. Let our hearts be inflamed and our wills be set to serve the living God. So meet us and do what no human being can do now as we worship you through the proclaimed word of God. And it's in Christ's name that we do pray. Amen. Amen. <clears throat> if you'll turn to 2 Peter, 2 Peter chapter 1. This morning we're going to begin uh, looking at verse 2. And so what we're currently doing is we're looking at Peter's salutation. Uh, this is just our third week into this epistle. If you're visiting this morning, you haven't missed too much. So what we've observed is the Paul, uh, Peter, as he begins writing, he says, I have the authority, I'm an apostle, I've seen the risen Christ. And so I, when I speak and when I write, I'm speaking for Christ, I'm his representative and his authority. But first and foremost, my position is I'm a bondservant of Jesus Christ. This is the only way I can see leadership working, is I have authority, but I'm a servant of Christ. I'm a foot washer to others. Secondly, we looked last time we were together at those who have received the same kind of faith as ours. We spent the whole time looking at this faith that we have was a gift from God. And God has granted us eyes to see and a heart to believe in the Lord Jesus Christ. It came from Him. He's the sovereign one. He's to be praised and worshiped all of your life that I sit here with the gift of faith this morning. Thank you, God, for the sweetest gift. Now the customary introduction. Let's look in verse 2. <clears throat> Peter now says, grace and peace be multiplied to you in the knowledge of God and of Jesus our Lord. Grace and peace be multiplied to you. I was looking at all of Paul's letters. When Paul wrote, he wished his readers grace and peace in every letter. In Timothy, he added grace, mercy, and peace. But all that Paul wanted, every letter he wrote to his writers, I want you to have grace and peace. And now Peter, his first letter, he said, may grace and peace be yours in fullest measure. And now may grace and peace be multiplied to you. And so the question is, is this just some customary greeting that they used in that day and age? Like, I, I hope this letter finds you well. Warm regards, best wishes. Or does this phrase capture the depth of what these apostles wish for the church of God, first and foremost, in every letter that they are writing. Every letter or gospel ever written has this as a goal, possibly, of why they are writing. The twin graces that the church of God needs for whatever it's facing every time they pick up their pen. The graces that make this place heaven on earth. The graces that will bring us through the trials that you're facing this morning. The graces that are going to bring us home safely. The graces that what we're studying right now will conform us to godliness. Or is this just a throwaway phrase? Let's get to the letter. Hi, now this is what I would like to write to you about. I believe the latter. I believe that the Holy Spirit doesn't have throwaway words. Every word is inspired by God and there's no throwaway words. And as I said that first week, Peter's whole letter is encompassed in this way. 
He begins in verse 2, grace and peace be multiplied to you, and he ends his letter, may you grow in the grace and knowledge of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. The whole epistle is encompassed in this. The first letter, grace and peace be yours in fullest measure, and then he closes that first letter, peace be to all you who are in Christ Jesus, which is the grace of God that you've been put in Christ Jesus. So this is the heart of Peter. Uh, everything he writes, he begins with grace and peace and he closes with grace and peace. This is what I want for the church of God. So what we'll look at this morning is not just a common greeting, but this is a heartfelt desire and goal and objective of what this early church leader, the rock, wanted for Christ's bride. The bride that's under attack by Nero and the bride that now has false teachers from within and without. And that is why uh, this is what they need. This is what Peter assesses for the church. And this is what every one of us uh, need here this morning. Uh, and a special prayer uh, for Kirk and Rima Garkow with, uh, this week when they'll find out uh, with this tumor on his kidney. What, what they need this morning is grace and peace. And what, what David and Lynn Chambliss need this morning is grace and peace. And what every one of us need this morning is we need grace and we need peace from our God. And so I guess I could easily say, as I've spent some time meditating on this this week, this is truly my own heart toward this flock. What do I want for you? Do I just want programs that work well? Good worship, financial stability, the absence of strife to make it a little more peaceful? This is so easily answered for me. I want grace and peace to be multiplied at Southside Bible Church. I want grace flowing through your lives, conforming you to the image of Jesus Christ. That's what I pray for, and that's what I'm going to preach for. That's all of my days. That's what I want for every soul sitting in this room. I want that to produce peace like a river in every one of your hearts in the midst of this world that has no peace, I want us to be these people full of peace through any circumstance, whatever we face, whatever fears, just a peace that's flowing in every one of us showing the Prince of Peace to the world. And so many of us have things that are troubling our hearts this morning, and I want you to so understand grace, Jesus, that the Prince of Peace will bring a holy hush to your soul this morning. When all around my soul gives way, he then is all my hope and stay. And so do you mind if I just pray again before we begin? If, if you do, you got problems. <clears throat> so I don't want this to be a greeting that we just pass by. I want this to be the reality of every one of our lives, and I want to go to God, and I want to ask him, and then we'll open it up together. Father, I pray now, I do want this for my own heart, and I want it for every heart this morning. I want grace to be multiplied in their hearts. And I want the flowing peace that comes from that. I want the world to look at these folks and say, what is it? How do they keep peace with the things that are scaring me to death and making me so anxious? And they walk into the blade of so many things and they got the mind of Christ. God, I pray that you would bring that to every heart, every troubled heart here this morning. God, meet us in a special way in your word and accomplish that. We pray in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. Grace and peace be multiplied to you in the knowledge of God and of Jesus our Lord. Point of the whole letter. Peter wants grace and peace to be multiplied and he wants it to increase. And so my question this morning, how does it increase? How, how do we grow in grace and and peace. I bet every one of you just want to grow in that and you want more of it. How? Well, Peter says there's a way, there's a thing called knowledge. And knowledge that it's not some new thing that we got to come up with, but it's knowledge, he says, that you need to remember. It's something you already know and you got to bring back again to your mind and your heart and remember it. So it's not something I got to go figure out that's new. It's to be stirred up to it again. It's not a new knowledge. I had this one man say to me, I just, I just don't have any peace and I just keep studying doctrinal books and I go from systematic theologies and I'm just, I, there's like this one truth I'm away from finding, finding peace. 
And if I could just get that truth, then I could get peace. And that guy is still looking for peace 20 years later, studying all the books. This thinking is just filling our land with everyone looking for new knowledge. And as a result, the old paths are being lost. The gospel's being lost. The paths that were fought, and at times and seasons, people died for these paths. And we're now throwing them away, discarding them, going, give me something new. Instead of these old paths that will lead you in verse 11 into a full entry into the kingdom of God. The writer of this epistle would give up his life for these old paths. He'll go be crucified upside down for these paths. And so the gospel is being forgotten. And it's, it's not enough for professing Christians anymore. It's the gospel plus. It's distorted with new things like this thing called a new perspective of Paul. A new understanding of eternal punishment. A new age movement. A new Calvinism. New, new. Everything's got to be new and everyone's running around. Give me something new. And Peter's telling us it's the old, old story of Jesus and his love that you need to remember. And that being made new in our hearts every day. So the old, old story is to be made new sitting here this morning as we come to the table of Jesus Christ. Peter's telling us it's the old, old story. And so what I would like to do, uh, this is the the key to growing uh, in these graces. So let's look this morning at these two graces and then how we can grow in them. So I'd like to begin first by looking at grace. Grace. Grace is simply, uh, if you could even use that word with grace, God's doing. It's God's doing to bring us back into a relationship with Him. And all the eternal blessings that go with that. Grace is God bringing us back to the place of paradise before the fall Man and God dwelling together in perfect unity. It's undoing the works of the devil. It's a reconciliation with us back to God and humanity creation. It's God as the center reference point of our lives being worshipped and adored. Uh, That's grace. It's what we looked at last week. Grace is God giving you the gift of faith in this gospel. Grace then is God joining you to Jesus Christ and every spiritual blessing that flows from that union so that we now get everything pertaining to life and godliness in this. We we get His divine power, verse 3 says. That's grace. I now have the divine power of God working in me to conform me to the image of Christ. That's power. God's grace. And the, the way that God can do this is through the righteousness of Jesus Christ. The death of the spotless Lamb of God is our substitute. That is pure grace, what God did in His Son. It's right. He did this for sinners. It wasn't merited. It wasn't earned. It wasn't deserved. Grace, I think, is the freest of all of God's acts. It's from His heart. He doesn't have to show it. It just... You know, it flows from his being, his attribute, his nature. God is gracious. Mercy kind of has an element where it's to relieve those in despair. He saw us in in pity and his mercy, his bowels were drawn out towards us. But grace does for us the opposite of what we deserve. He sees us in our filth and rejection and hatred and it comes and it moves toward us and acts for us. And and who we were should have only drawn the wrath of God. So grace is contrary to everything that we should have gotten. It's opposite and amazing response of God toward us in our sin was grace that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. It's giving us the opposite of what we deserve by giving to His Son the opposite of what He deserves. Grace is that He put His Son where only we deserve to be on a cross. So that he could put us where only his son deserves to be at his bosom in fellowship. Amazing grace. How sweet the sound. And I just pray and ask for more words and fuller ways to express to you the glory of God's grace. And if you get it, you're never going to be the same. But here's where the confusion comes in. I've spent 20 years 
trying to show you that this grace is perfect and it's complete and it's final. Tetelestai, I, it's so sufficient to cover all of your sins and to bring you into God's grace and bring you to glory. I just, I, I can't preach enough how sufficient His grace is and, and it's finished. It's yours. And you can't add to it. You add to it and you destroy grace. One stitch of your own righteousness in the garment of Christ and you ruin the whole thing. Just add one little stitch and you're going to destroy the righteous garment of Christ that you've been wrapped in by grace through faith. So it's perfect. It's finished. Do you know your forgiveness can't be any more? It's just forgiven. Your acceptance with God cannot be any more. You can't grow into levels. Fully accepted this morning, 100%. Your reconciliation, you can't be any more reconciled to God. Your peace with God cannot be any deeper in the heart of God this very morning. So why talk about growing in grace? Why make the theme of your epistle and the theme of every New Testament letter growing in grace? And I'd like to call John Newton to the church this morning. Come on in, John. Help us because he was the master of growing in grace. He got it. And in his famous song, he said, Grace saved you. It saved a wretch like me. Grace has brought me through many dangers, toils, and snares. His grace just keeps bringing me through everything that comes up against me. And he says, it's grace that's going to bring me safely home. Amazing grace. This whole eternal journey that God has brought you on to bless you forever is, is grace. And you've got to get that. And grace is what God did to bring you into His presence. You can't grow in that. But hear this. You can grow in your knowledge and your understanding of it. And you must grow in it. You need to be convinced and persuaded of grace. That is my ministry. To keep preaching this word and persuade you of the fullness and the beauty of grace. Grace is what you need in verse 4 to escape the corruptions in this world by lust. The way you're going to overcome this world and its corruptions is this grace. Grace justifies you. It declares you not guilty before God, and grace sanctifies you. It makes you holy. You need grace to have the the fruit that we're going to look at in verses 5 through 7 of 2 Peter. Grace is what's going to produce that. Peter's working hard for you to understand how you're going to get conformed, changed life. We need grace if we're ever going to be changed. Your power will never change you. Only this power of God that he has given to us in Christ. So in verse 3 of Peter, the Christian life, it's not changing the outside. It's not just working on all the externals, which is what every cult teaches. Here's how you change. Here's the things you got to do. And you just try to change outside. Grace says he comes and it changes the inside, your motives, your desires, your hopes, and it just transforms the outside. This is how the new covenant changes and transforms. And so if you're never going to be conformed, if you're ever going to be conformed to Christ, if you're ever going to have this, this moral excellence growing all the way into climaxing in agape love, it will only come by the grace of God which is what? Verse 3, it says it's God's power at work in us, giving us everything pertaining to what? Life and godliness. Let that take your breath away. God's saying, I'm giving you my power for everything you need to live a life of godliness. You have the power. It's been given to you in Christ. And so spiritual growth, as we looked a couple weeks ago, we looked at that little acorn that's going to go in the ground and it's going to break through cement and it's going to become this big, huge oak. This grace is at work. And so many of your lives this morning, I love watching oak trees grow up. Nothing makes me happier than a bunch of oak trees. They're all over the place. This is like the Redlands, Redwoods, wherever that place is in California with the big, what's it called? Redwoods. But it's a park, isn't it? Like an area? I don't know. There's huge, massive trees, and they're all over the place here at this church. This grace will bring you to verse 11, where everything's going to open up to you in glory. I want you to listen to what Paul said. Therefore, in Romans 5, having been justified by faith that we looked at last week, we have 
peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. You now have peace with God through whom also we have obtained our introduction by faith into what? Into this grace in which we now stand. We now stand in grace. And this is what I want for Southside. I want grace multiplied to you. I don't want unbelief to dam up the flow of grace. It it blocks it. Pride blocks the flow of grace. I want where a whole church is escaping the corruption of this world that is controlled by all of its lusts because of the grace of God. I want that for every one of us. This is my prayer and my passion for every soul here at Southside. If grace isn't multiplied to you, you're going to spend all of your days trying to change and grow by your own power, and it's going to have an Ishmael result. Raise your hand. No, Aren't you just worn out? Trying to keep changing in your own power? It's miserable. It's like that... Uh, Pilgrim's Progress, just trying to clean yourself up and you're sweeping and all the dust is choking you. To just have religion. Paul wrote to Timothy, you have a form of religion, but you deny its power. What does that mean? You're you're denying the grace of God. You're doing external things. You got a nice little form and you do all the right things. It's there. But you don't have the grace of God changing you from the inside to the outside. You're denying the very power of God. Don't do that. That's what this book is about. It's what Paul prayed for the Ephesian church. Listen to what he said. I pray, Ephesus, that the eyes of your heart may be enlightened so that you may know what is the hope of his calling, what are the riches of the glory of his inheritance in the saints, And what is the surpassing greatness of His power toward us who believe? These are in accordance with the working of the strength of His might. I pray that you would get the power that is yours and available, child of God, this morning. I want grace multiplied to you. What would happen if we quit using willpower to try to change and it was met with the grace of Almighty God Acorns would become big trees. So get this. Knowing this grace, really understanding that the God of the universe, He is for you. Some of you don't believe that. Do you believe the grace of God? He's for you because of what He's done. He, He really likes you. He delights over you. He loves you. You're in the righteousness of Christ. We saw last week. He loves you with a love that is infinite and perfect. His divine will is for you to give you a perfect landing in glory. His grace will turn every trial into pure gold. He promises that any suffering saint. He's going to turn it to pure gold, refined faith that's going to trust and love and know Him deeper. His hand will give you your daily bread. His hand will look at the birds of the air and the lilies, and He's just saying, how much more you who I gave my son for, to just believe. I'm for you. I'm going to take care of your bills. All these things you're stressing about, I'm God. I'm for you. His purposes for your life will ripen fast. He has purpose for every soul. That should produce something real and tangible to the church of God. The most coveted and sought out desire and the less attained and maintained is peace. This grace should bring peace. You see, we're not like the world and its corruption. Why is the world chasing its lusts? Because it's looking for what will satisfy them. It's chasing something. And so, so there's no uh, self-control. There's just epithumias, these desires so strong to, to try to give you peace. And our own epithumias replaced with desire for Christ and growth is, is peace. And I'm going to look at that whole thing in, in two weeks. So that made no sense at all. We're going to spend a whole sermon on it. But peace to the world is sitting by the ocean on a secluded beach, just sitting there, and and that's peace. Just feels good, but is that really peace? Their consciences are still accusing them of guilt and sin within. 
they know it's going to come to an end. I know more people sitting there on vacation, oh, it's so good, but I know it's going to come to an end, and i got to get back. So there's even no peace in that. Peace for the child of God is to find himself in Christ the way Peter closed his last epistle. In the Prince of Peace, you're loved and accepted by God. You stand in grace now. You're surrounded and encompassed by His grace, and He who began a good work is going to complete it, and He's going to cause all things to work together for good, the conforming of your life to the image of Christ. He's going to take care of you like birds and sparrows. He is a very present help in the time of trouble. Grace is growing in it, and in growing in grace should produce peace. When you realize what you favor and what God is for you, you, you should have a peace. I, I've got peace. Not a surge of worry, not a care or doubt. Stayed upon Jehovah, hearts are fully blessed. Finding, as he promised, perfect peace and rest. His perfect love casts out all fear. And so I, I pray that this grace will multiply in every one of your hearts a peace. What do I got to worry about if I'm loved by God? Let that drive out every fear you're facing this morning. And so these can't be truths that we put up on a mantle. They can't be heirlooms. They, they can't just be cold, memorized verses and cold doctrines. They must be remembered. They must be at the center of our hearts. That is it. Aliens who understand truly God's grace. People who really do trust Him. We really do trust Him because of grace, which produces peace and not a striving because everything's not dependent on me and me doing everything and working everything out. I've got peace because the living God is my Father working for my good, molding, shaping, unfolding His purposes in my life. I have these times when all these fears will hit me and assuage me at once. And they could be big deals like, I think my kid might have leukemia. I'm, I'm running out of years to work. I've got no savings and no social security. What am I thinking? <laughs> you start meditating on that and it can bring anxiety. And these things start coming. And Isaiah anxiety hits so hard and I, I feel like I'm going to pass out. And I look at all my resources and all my thoughts to try to fix it. I, I, t I tend to run to, okay, what can I do? How can I fix this? What doctor can I get to? All of these things. And, and when I do that, you know what happens? The anxieties increase. They just keep growing and growing. And then in Christ, we begin to fight the fight of faith. And we begin looking that I stand in grace. And what comes from that is the fruit of peace. And that's what he wants us to grow in. I'm in the grace of God. I'm cared for and loved by God. And I just get peace every time I bring my heart and my mind back to that reality. The sweetest grace is known to man. I pray that they would be multiplied to you this morning. May God bless you and grant you these beautiful graces that produce full joy in every heart. And so the last point in closing, how do I get this multiplied to me? I want that. How does God dispense his grace how does God multiply his peace in his children and I want you to hear this real clearly it's not like a vending machine it isn't okay here's 30 options and I'll take grace for that and you pull it out and it comes out to you it's not through some formula I spent all my early years trying to figure out the formula uh, to get grace it's not a little pithy saying the answer is the best answer I've ever known, and I love it. God is a gracious God. It's an attribute. But how does He display it to us? He's chosen to reveal it to us. And the simple answer is in His Son. To see the grace of God is to stare into the face of Jesus Christ. If you want to understand grace, go stare into the face of Christ and it's just grace upon grace. John tells us that he was full of grace and truth. In John 1.16, for out of his fullness, Christ's fullness, we've all received what? Grace upon grace upon grace. 
The law was given through Moses, but grace and truth were realized through Jesus Christ. No man has seen God at any time, the only begotten God who's at the bosom of the Father. He has explained Him. You see Him, and you see the full grace of God. And the face of Christ is where I find the grace of God. He is the eternal well of all grace. I don't muster it up. I don't spend a life searching for it. I find it in Jesus Christ. The way we grow in grace, the way we grow in peace in our passage this morning is in the knowledge of God and of Jesus Christ, our Lord. This is where many have gone astray. This is where many are content to live their Christian lives at a distance from Christ. I just want to keep all the rules and do all the right things and come and hear sermons and pray. It's just, everything about me is it's just, I, I do these things apart from Jesus Christ. And I'm happy with creeds. I like those. I like doctrines. I like rote prayers. They're my favorite. I like ritualism, denominations. I like fundamentalism, moralism. <clears throat> I just like all that stuff because you could do it without Jesus. That's not it. Just a simple illustration. If you broke off a branch from its vine and placed it one inch away from the vine, the branch that's in the vine, uh, would it do any good? Is just being close to the vine going to help that branch? Just doing Bible studies about the vine, will that do anything for you? I've got notebooks full about the vine. I can tell you every doctrine about the vine that there is, but I'm six inches away from it. I gather with a bunch of people, and we talk about all the theological truths of the vine. My favorite pastime. I love talking about the doctrines of Jesus. It fills me. We can encourage each other. One day the vine is going to come back. Maranatha. Can't wait to meet him. Would seeing all the branches around you budding do anything to help you? Is it helping you to watch people just exploding here in their faith? Is that doing anything to change you? Would seeing the beauty of the vine and marveling at it, wow, that vine is amazing. It will never help. The gift of faith joins you to the vine. And Jesus says boldly, I am the vine. I'm the vine, and by faith now you are mystically joined to Jesus Christ. And now you're like Paul. There's one thing that I do. I want to know him. I want to know the vine experientially. I want to know this Christ. So don't miss this. This is major. This is not just studying about Jesus. Some of you need to repent this morning. It's not, i got to study more about Jesus. I can outline every book in the Bible and I can show you how it points to Jesus. All 66 books, I can show you the theme of each book is Jesus. I can end every lesson I teach and I can tell you it's all about Jesus. And I can cry when I watch the passion of the Christ and never have this kind of knowledge. And the Greek word is epigenosis. We've talked about it a lot, so I'm not going to get stuck on it. But gnosis means knowledge. And epigenosis means a full knowledge. I get this. It's that gift of faith. It's the one that, that sees the glory of God in the face of Christ in 2 Corinthians 4. God says, let there be light. And you see His glory and His beauty now. You see Him as a Savior. He's beautiful. He's beautiful. It's the one that faith shows you that the righteousness of Christ that we talked about last week, you finally say it's mine. Instead of spending all your days subconsciously still trying to clean up your life and change so that God can finally love you. And your whole life has been characterized by religion and moralism and fixing up. And, and you're just sitting here trying to change yourself. It's not going to work. It's not going to work. This shows that where sin increased, grace abounded all the more. I believe this gospel has swallowed up all of my sin. 
It's truly washed away. I truly am righteous and accepted before God now with peace. Do you see the beauty of this gospel? Sinner, this joins you to Christ. And when I look at what we remember this morning, the death on a cross, I smile and say, even my sins. Can you say that? Because it's not enough to say, I know that Jesus died on a cross for people's sins. This is talking about my sins. And he's lovely to me. This is the knowledge of intimacy. This is being attached to a vine. What, what's happened to the church that we've lost the most beautiful, important principle of the whole Bible? This is about being joined to Jesus Christ. This is where grace is found. This is where it flows through my branches and bears the fruit of verses 5 through 7. Uh, moral excellence, knowledge, self-control, perseverance, godliness, brotherly kindness, and love. This is what comes out of someone who's attached to Jesus. That, that, that verses 5 through 7, some of you are going to take that, just like the Ten Commandments, and go work on them. That isn't going to be it. It's going to be an organic nature. It's going to bear fruit like a vine and a branch. Guys, we're to grow in the epigenosis of Christ, the full knowledge of Him, to see Him in all of His beauty as He's revealed Himself in Scripture, to see Him in all of my life, to pray and to abide in Christ. This illustration will come very short, but in high school I knew about this girl named Laura, and I knew her, her sister very well, and I knew that there, she had a younger sister who was kind of cute. And she, I knew she was a cheerleader. And I knew some things about Laura. But then on February 10th, 1989, stood on an altar and vowed to love her all of my days. And I know Laura. And over 30 years, I know her in a deep, deep way. And this knowledge of my bride... It's invigorated my love and desire to pour out all that I have to see her conform to the image of Christ. I met Christ in 1987 with an epigenosis. And he really became a treasure hidden in a field and I gave up everything that I could follow him. And I've sought his face now for 32 years and I've grown in the knowledge of this Christ. And I've experienced his patient, purifying love in my life. I can just stand here and say, he's my best friend. I don't have to think about that. Grow in this intimate knowledge and relationship with Jesus Christ. May grace be multiplied to you this morning. His power flows through this knowledge. And this knowledge brings peace. John Newton, I want to quote from John Newton said, Christ is the fountain, the sun, and the treasury of all grace. He's where we get all grace from. When Newton speaks of grace, he's speaking of Christ in the union with the believer. For Newton, grace is ever, he said, uh, grace is ever my grace. It's a sovereign grace from God, an all-sufficient grace, alone sufficient grace that flows freely and fully from the person of Jesus Christ. All of grace comes from this person. He, he's the fountain. He's where I get all grace. And he says, by nature, we're separated from the divine life. And as branches broken off, we were withered and fruitless. But Newton says, grace through faith unites us to Christ, the living vine, from whom as the root of all fullness, a constant supply of sap and influence is derived into each of his mystical branches, enabling them to bring forth fruit unto God, verses 5 through 7, and to persevere, verse 11, and abound therein. He said, a life in union with Christ is the life of grace. All grace comes from the one full of grace and truth. And I've been joined to him and I seek this epigenosis to know this Christ 
to love him, to look in this word and see his glory and his beauty everywhere I go. The Christian life is look at this Christ. Behold him. And this destroys this dead, apathetic, moralistic stuff that's in our church today. And even some branches that are are sitting here today just with all the externals. And you, you don't have any branch there's just the, it's just no vine. And I'm just asking this morning that you're seeing the beauty of what God has offered in Christ. Come to me, all who are weary and heavy laden. I'll give you rest and I will, I'll join you to me so that grace will flow for everything necessary for life and godliness. Newton says, in our abiding union with Christ, we find the context of the Christian life. Grace not only connects us to Christ, But grace is daily the motivation for us to press toward Christ, to be daily hungering and thirsting after Him, and daily receiving from His fullness, even grace for grace, that you may rejoice in His all-sufficiency and may taste His love in every dispensation. We seek more grace by seeking to experience more of Christ. Next week, I'm going to spend a whole sermon to unpack what it means to grow in epigenosis and understand the fullness of it. And I pray that God would grant us peace. May it be multiplied now to all of us now as we remember. We're going to remember how we can be joined to such a branch, such a vine. And as we stare at the grace of God, dying on our behalf for our sins, reconciling us to God in His favorable presence. May it bring peace to every heart and a greater measure to every one of us here this morning. And so let's pray, and we will go to the communion table together. Father, I pray that as we come now to this table, I pray that every heart sees the beauty and the glory of Christ. I pray, Lord, for repentance, if we've lost our first love and we've got caught up in duty and all these things that we're doing and and being busy like the church at Ephesus and church discipline and finding false teachers and in the middle of all that, they lost this sweet Christ. God, I pray that all our hearts would be unified again in one. The glory and the beauty of this Christ is to, to be pursued and enjoyed and tasted, believed in and trusted. God, where we find grace is in Christ. Oh, the beauty of Christ. Let us drink deeply from the well of grace. And God, may you grant peace to every heart in believing. I pray in that sweet name. Amen. The preceding message was presented by Southside Bible Church in Centennial, Colorado, and we hope you've been challenged and encouraged to grow in your relationship with Christ. Each week, our sermons are made available online and may be downloaded and distributed. If you have questions or comments or would like to speak to one of our pastors, please contact us through our website at southsidebible.org.